Okay, so let's start with the idea of a cell. Now, biology is the uh, is the science of the understanding of living systems, living um, uh, organisms. Now, as with any science, uh, science. Um, whether you're talking about chemistry, physics, biology, whatever, typically, in order to understand uh, systems which are as complex as the kinds of systems that we're talking about, or even simpler systems, scientists typically try to break those systems down into their functional components or their smallest um, uh, uh, divisible components in order to understand them. Uh, and so if biology is the science of living things, uh, we first need to be able to distinguish what's living from what's non-living. Now, hopefully you will have all covered this long before you hit GCSE, the idea that living things have seven fundamental characteristics, um, movement, respiration, sensitivity to changes in their environment, growth, reproduction, excretion, nutrition, and also some people consider homeostasis to be the eighth characteristic of living things. But all living things will do all uh, of those uh, will have all of those characteristics. Now, the smallest unit of matter, the smallest living unit of matter that fulfills all of those characteristics is the cell. And so cells are typically referred to as the building blocks of life. Now, it was actually the invention and the development of the microscope in the 16th and the 17th century, which was um, probably one of the biggest milestones in the development of biology because it was the first time people could actually see that living things were made of these fundamental building blocks, these cells. And it was Robert Hooke, uh, a famous English scientist who was famous not just for his discoveries in biology but also in physics as well uh, and other sciences, um, who was largely responsible for some of the f uh, earliest advances in this. Now, he made these discoveries uh, while examining very thin shavings of cork, which is a plant material, under a microscope that he himself built. So this is a drawing of Robert Hooke's microscope. Now, when he examined these very thin pieces of cork, he made very detailed drawings of what he saw, and this is one of those drawings. Hooke called these compartments that he, that he observed in the cork cells because they reminded him of the small rooms where monks slept in monasteries, which were called cellular. So this is where we get the word cell from, and Hooke was one of the first people to use a microscope to discover the structure of animals and plants, uh, and the idea that they weren't just made of these continuous materials, that the materials that living organisms are made of are themselves composed of these smaller, fundamental living units. So this is actually a photograph of uh, the the microscope that Robert Robert Hooke built. Uh, it is rather ornate uh, and quite beautiful, but uh, this was something that he built, and uh, this revolutionised our understanding of living uh, living organisms. So uh, let's talk about cells now in uh, by use of an analogy. So just as a wall is made from smaller units called bricks, uh, living organisms, animals, plants, and other organisms are made up of smaller units or building blocks called cells. So we can see the cells that compose this section of a leaf, this transverse section of a leaf, as viewed under a microscope. So um, you might want to consider where this analogy falls down. Um, well, one obvious uh, difference um, between the bricks in a brick wall and the cells in a structure like this is that the bricks are all uniform in their size and shape, whereas cells, even though they share many of the same characteristics, are non-uniform in their sizes and shapes. But there are other uh, differences and limitations to this analogy as there are with any analogy. So cells are very, very small, and your exam, uh, your exam boards do require you to have a good understanding of the general scale of uh, cells and also structures uh, within cells and tissues as well. So your body is made up of about 10 to the power 14 cells. That's 100 trillion cells. And this gives you a, a sense of just how small these cells are. Now, if you look at just one drop of blood from a finger and observe it under a microscope, you should be able to see thousands of individual blood cells. <clears throat> so this is actually a micrograph of a, a drop of blood as viewed under a microscope and even in a very small proportion of the image we can see that there are many many blood cells all of these are red blood cells this is a white blood cell this is another white blood cell here so how small is a cell well we need at least an optical microscope in order to measure them now typically um, objects 
viewed under an optical or a light microscope are measured in uh, units, divisions of a meter called micrometers, which is written using the Greek symbol mu for micro. Now, a micrometer or a micro any unit, any uh, the, this prefix micro in front of any unit, uh, measure, uh, unit of measurement means one millionth of that unit. And what this means is if there are a thousand millimeters in a meter, then one micrometer is one thousandth of a millimeter. So this diagram compares the thickness of a human hair to the size of some different animal cells. So let's start with the largest human cell that we can find, which is the, uh, the ovum, the uh, female gamete. Now a female gamete is just a tiny bit smaller than the thickness of a human hair and if you're very very sharp eyed and you have the right kind of background to the cell you should just about be able to make it out with, a hum uh, with the, the naked eye. Now cheek cells in contrast are a bit smaller, nerve cells are very long but very thin, sperm cells are very small, white blood cells are quite small and red blood cells are extremely small. So this gives you a sense of the sizes and the range of sizes that you can find um, uh, just within human cells alone. Now uh, I'm going to quickly uh, change the screen to uh, a, a simulation that I'm rather fond of, uh, this simulation here we, which you can find uh, at this URL uh, it, and it's a very uh, cool little uh, tool that lets you compare the sizes and the scales of various things. So again a human being is about 1.7 meters tall. If we zoom in and go down to the uh, smaller objects here we can find that as we scroll down here we're dealing with successively smaller measurements. So now we're down to 10 to the power minus three meters, which is one millimeter. Pay attention to these powers of 10 as well, because you will need to be able to convert between these and uh, use these in your calculations. So when we get down to um, uh, about one millimeter and smaller, we get to our larger uh, types of cells. So an amoeba is 350 micrometers. So 350 micrometers, well, one micrometer is one times 10 to the power minus six of a meter. And so 350 micrometers is equivalent to 3.5 times 10 to the power minus four meters. And this is a protist called the amoeba. Now, if we, uh, if we zoom in a bit more, we see that the ovum is about 120 micrometers. Zoom in a bit more, we've got a skin cell, red blood cells, about seven or eight micrometers. Uh, smaller than this, we have some of the components of cells. Now you'll notice a red blood cell is about the same size, maybe a shade smaller than a chloroplast, which is a component, a, an organelle that you find within plant cells. Mitochondria are organelles that you find within uh, eukaryotic cells, and these are about four micrometers. Here we have a chromosome at four micrometers as well. Here is an E. coli bacterium, which is one of the larger bacteria. This is two micrometers. So you can see the, the, the comparison between uh, an E. coli bacterium, a prokaryotic cell, and a large human cell. The, the, the size is very, very different. Now, if we scroll in a little bit further, we get down to the sizes of viruses. Now viruses, strictly speaking, are not living organisms. Uh, they only perform one of those seven or eight characteristics of living things, namely reproduction. So this gives you a sense of the scales and the sizes of these things. Now this simulation is particularly useful uh, both for, uh, well, for biology, chemistry and physics because you can look at particles like molecules uh, and their relative sizes, atoms, and even smaller objects uh, uh, where the sizes are somewhat theoretical. So we get down to about the size of a proton or a neutron, anything smaller than that, then these are uh, the sizes of these things are yet to be confirmed by experimentation. So we've got quarks, which make up baryonic particles like protons and neutrons, and further down. But obviously we're not going to go into that because this is biology and not quantum theory. But just to pique your interest, uh, you can also go to the very, very large. So if we scroll back up to the level of the human where we started, you can also get larger. So you can find some quite interesting and uh, very sh uh, somewhat shocking things when you start to zoom out to the very, very large. So I'll let you guys have a play around with this and I'll include a link with the, uh, to this in the interactive uh, replay video of this webinar as well. So some living things such as bacteria and protozoa are um, unicellular. In other words, they're each living organism of those types of those species are single-celled. 
So one of the examples that we've just seen is an amoeba, another is a uh, paramecium. So these are microscopic unicellular creatures which you find living in ponds and streams. Some fungi, which are microorganisms, are unicellular, yeast being the most commonly, uh, commonly known, which is used to make beer, wine, bread, and other uh, foods. But many other fungi are multicellular. They form mushrooms, for example. So mushrooms and toadstools are the fruiting bodies. These are the reproductive organs of multicellular fungi. Penicillium mold uh, is the is a multicellular fungus, and uh, this is the uh, fungus from which we extract the antibiotic penicillin. So, living organisms are generally classified, firstly, into two large domains. We have the prokarya and the eukarya, and these are subdivided into three domains into which all uh, all of all living organisms fit. So, the eukarya are the types of organisms made of eukaryotic cells, and these include the protist kingdom, the fungus, uh, the fungus kingdom, the plant kingdom, and the animal kingdom. In contrast, the uh, bacteria and the archaea, these are unicellular organisms which are prokaryotic. And so even before we get to the level of kingdoms, phyla, classes, orders, families, genus, genera, and species, we first divide all living organisms into these two super domains of the prokarya and the eukarya and these, this division is on the basis of the cellular structure that makes them up so this goes back to what i said at the very beginning here um, when we when we're trying to study living uh, living organisms what we're studying as scientists are the most complex systems that human beings have ever um, come across uh, a single bacterium is way 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 more complex uh, than anything say an astronomer might study they're studying things on a huge scale but those systems are relatively such straightforward when you look at bacteria you could take all of the laboratories and all of the scientists and all of the resources and all of the money in the world and ask those laboratories and scientists to make a bacterium from scratch from raw materials and they simply couldn't do it it's way too complex and we simply don't understand enough about it now given that that's the case given that biology deals with the most complex systems uh, that human beings have ever come across it's even more important that we start to classify organisms into groups um, so that we can better talk about them and understand them but what better way of classifying things into groups than fundamentally on the basis of the building blocks that make them up the building blocks the cells that make up eukaryotic organisms have quite different features from the building blocks the cells that make up prokaryotic organisms like bacteria and archaea so the groups into which living things are said to belong are always being reviewed as new information and genetic information in particular is gathered in the old days we only really divided things into kingdoms but then as more information emerged and we started to understand more about the genetic differences and the structural differences between eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells this three domain system emerged so today we commonly use this system which is based upon three domains and it's the eukarya which are divided into these kingdoms so the eukarya is the domain made up of all living things classified into those five kingdoms that we mentioned before. So these organisms occupy a very diverse range of habitats and display various types of nutrition, types of feeding. So some members of this domain obtain their uh, nutrients by digestion and absorption, and that includes things like some protists, uh, fungi and animals, whereas other members of this domain uh, will obtain their nutrition by um, autotrophy, which is uh, an example of which is photosynthesis by creating their own uh, nutrients using energy and uh, inorganic substances in their environment. Now, most members of the eukaryotic domain are in fact multicellular, but the protists, um, for, for example, amoeba, are unicellular and also some fungi such as yeast that we mentioned before. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the structure of animals versus plant cells because to be honest, this doesn't really go much beyond the uh, requirements that you encountered in year nine and perhaps even earlier. So if you need to pause and uh, um, identify these structures using these labels, then please do so. These are the typical structures that you find in a plant cell. Now, before we look at the ones in an animal cell, remember plants 
are eukaryotic cells. Now, the biggest single difference, the one thing that distinguishes prokaryotic cells from eukaryotic cells is that eukaryotic cells have internal organelles, each of which are surrounded, many of which are surrounded like this uh, central vacuole in this plant cell, and also the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, the uh, nuclear envelope, all of these organelles uh, are themselves surrounded by a membrane. So eukaryotic cells, the biggest single difference between them and prokaryotic cells is that they contain internal membrane-bound organelles, but there are other differences. So this is a typical uh, animal cell, uh, showing many of the typical features of an animal cell. So here you can see the plasma membrane, the microvilli on its surface. Obviously, some of these will not uh, uh, be... Um, some animal cells will not have all of these features. This is simply a diagram showing some of the typical features of a generalized animal cell. So we have the cytosol, which is the cytoplasm. The uh, Well, the cytoplasm is everything within the membrane, including the organelles. The cytosol is the gel-like liquid in which all of the uh, organelles of the cell uh, float. You have the nucleus and the nuclear envelope around it, rough endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, the Golgi body, uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and other organelles such as lysosomes, free ribosomes, centrioles which are used in cell division and also microtubules and microfilaments. Now these make up the cytoskeleton uh, which is what allows the amoeba for example to move around and change the shape of its uh, surface but it also allows organelles within the cell to be moved around such as lysosomes and uh, things like that as well. So let's quickly summarize the main features of eukaryotic cells. First of all, as we saw on that uh, simulation, eukaryotic cells are generally much larger than prokaryotic cells. They also differ in firstly having a cytoplasm that contains membrane-bound organelles. The other main difference is that cytoplasmic ribosomes, the ribosomes found in the cytoplasm uh, in eukaryotic cells are larger than the ones found in prokaryotic cells. Another major difference, perhaps the second biggest difference, is that eukaryotic cells have a membrane-bound nucleus that contains the genetic material, the DNA. Uh, in prokaryotes, the DNA floats around as a circular loop in a central portion of the cytoplasm, but it doesn't have a nucleus, uh, a nuclear membrane around it. Uh, now, another thing is that the cell wall in eukaryotic cells such as plant cells and fungi is made up of a very different material than the cell wall that you find in um, prokaryotes, in bacteria and archaea. In bacteria, the cell wall is made up of a glycoprotein called murein, whereas in uh, plant cells, for example, the cell wall is made of cellulose, and in fungi, it's made up of a, of a substance called chitin. So prokaryotic living things belong to two domains, the bacteria and the archaea. Now, you don't really need to know about the archaea in a great deal of uh, detail for, uh, or at all for uh, GCSE. I just mention it here because it kind of um, it is relevant to the fact that both of these are prokaryotic organisms. So these occupy, again, a diverse range of habitats and also display various modes of nutrition. So these two domains, the bacteria and the archaea, both of which are prokaryotic domains, they obtain their nutrients by absorption, by photosynthesis, and by another form of self-feeding called chemosynthesis. Now, saprobiotic bacteria, photoautotrophic bacteria, and chemoautotrophic bacteria, these are all examples of bacteria that feed in various different ways. Saprobionts are the bacteria which break down the dead remains of other organisms. Um, Photoautotrophic bacteria are photosynthetic bacteria, and chemoautotrophic bacteria are bacteria which use chemical reactions and the energy released by chemical reactions in their environment to, gener uh, to, um, uh, to absorb the energy with which to create simple sugars from uh, substances in their environment. So there's a lot of different types of uh, prokaryotes. Um, we're going to be examining specifically bacteria here. So reproduction in prokaryotes is asexual. Now what this means is it does not involve gametes. It does not involve male or female. It's simply a form of cell division. Now the cell division that occurs whereby bacteria 
uh, reproduce themselves is not mitosis. It is similar to mitosis in a couple of respects, but it's not, it's not quite the same. Uh, it's called binary fission, which literally means splitting in two. That's what they do. They, uh, about one bacterium becomes two bacteria, two bacteria become four, and so on. Now, all prokaryotes uh, possess typical prokaryotic features, all bacteria, I should say, sorry, um, possess typical prokaryotic features. So again, the lack of a defined nucleus and also no membrane-bound organelles and also a tough protected, uh, protective cell wall. The chromosome in prokaryotes and bacteria is a single large loop of genetic material, unlike in eukaryotes where the um, the DNA is linear and organized into chromosomes and surrounded by a nucleus. You don't have that in, pro, in prokaryotic organisms. It's simply a very large single loop of DNA which sits in the middle of the cytoplasm without a nuclear membrane around it. So we mentioned the differences in the cell wall of a bacterium and the archaea have some other specific features which again you don't necessarily need to know for GCSE, I just include them here for maybe a little bit of extra detail for those of you who are interested. So let's, let, let's take a look at a, uh, at a diagram of a typical uh, or generalized bacterium and again not all bacteria have all of these features but there are some features which are always present and some features which are sometimes present. So the structures which are always present are a cell wall made of that, that glycoprotein, murein, a cell surface membrane or plasma membrane, and then you have these food reserve granules and a circular loop of DNA which makes up the bacterial DNA molecule, the bacterial chromosome. You also have smaller ribosomes. Now, the size of ribosomes is given in Svedberg units, uh, and the size of ribosomes in bacteria and prokaryotes is about 70s. Uh, in eukaryotes, it's about 80s. So you don't really need to know the numbers or about Svedberg units. Just remember that the ribosomes that you find in pro prokarya are smaller than the ones that you find in eukarya. Obviously, you also have cytosol and the cytoplasm. Now, in some bacteria, but not all, you also have some other features. So you have these fimbriae or pili, which are used by bacteria to adhere to surfaces. You sometimes have uh, small circular loops of DNA called plasmids. Now, these allow one bacterium to transfer genes to another bacteria. And this is actually very important in the way in which... Uh, uh, antibiotic resistance is passed from one bacteria to another, for example. You also sometimes have a uh, sometimes have a slime layer or a capsule. Now, the purpose of this in some bacteria is to pr protect them in dry conditions from completely drying out and allow them to survive those conditions until they are hydrated again. Uh, some bacteria also have a long uh, tail-like projection which whizzes round like a propeller and propels them through the liquid that they're in called a flagellum. So the term flagellum is singular, flagelli is plural. So again, uh, the comparative size of one of the smaller eukaryotic cells, the red blood cell, is somewhere between six to eight micrometers in diameter. Whereas a E. coli bacterium, which is about a medium-sized or slightly larger-sized rod-shaped bacterium, is, in comparison, uh, is, is much smaller even than one of the smallest eukaryotic human cells. Streptococcus pneumoniae is, again, smaller than that, which is another uh, bacterium. So, let's take a look again at the bacterial genome. So, the genome of a bacterium is just one long loop of DNA, which, in contrast to eukaryotes, eukaryotes have strands, individual linear strands of DNA. So we also mentioned that plasmids can also be found in the bacterial uh, cytoplasm. These are smaller loops of DNA which can actually be transferred from one individual bacterium to another to allow that bacterium, the second bacterium, to take on the genes of the first. So let's quickly summarize the features of uh, prokaryotic cells before we move on. So again, prokarya are much smaller than eukarya. Prokaryotic cells have a cytoplasm that lacks membrane-bound organelles, so no mitochondria, no chloroplasts, nothing like that. They have ribosomes that are smaller than those in eukaryotes. They have no nucleus, and they have a cell wall which, doesn't, which is made up of a different material than the cell walls of eukaryotic cells like plant cells or fungi. It's made up of a glycoprotein called murein.
Now, in addition, many prokaryotic cells possess one or more plasmids. They possess a capsule uh, surrounding the cell, a slime layer which prevents them from drying out or desiccating. They possess one or more flagelli, and they may form chains or clusters. They're not when when bacteria form chains or clusters, they're not considered to be a multicellular organism because what you have is individual. Uh, free living bacteria which themselves are individual unicellular organisms that have clustered together um, in a colony so that's the distinction there okay so let's move on now to the second thing that you all voted for for me to go through which is uh, mitosis now cell division in eukaryotes is either mitotic or meiotic in this particular um webinar we're not going to go into meiosis in, in any great depth because that is going to be covered in a later webinar for GCSE biology students so we're going to focus on cell division in particular on mitosis uh, now also what I want to um, raise before we go into this is strictly speaking mitosis and meiosis are not forms of cell division they're types of nuclear division they are ways in which the nucleus uh, divides uh, to lead to daughter nuclei with a particular number of chromosomes in them. Now cytokinesis follows uh, the nuclear division. Cytokinesis is the process by which the cell itself divides to produce two daughter cells. So it's a fine point of biological language but if you're aiming for the very highest marks and more importantly if you're aiming for the deepest understanding of these principles you really need to get your language right with these things. So strictly speaking mitosis and meiosis are forms of nuclear division which are followed by cell division cytokinesis so in order to understand these uh, types of nuclear division we need to first understand a little bit about chromosomes and inheritance now uh, the idea of chromosomes we're going to go into in a lot more depth uh, later on when we look at uh, genetics uh, but we're going to we're going to need to kind of review some of the basics of this in order to understand mitosis meiosis and cell division so the cells of eukaryotic organisms like uh, animals and plants uh, contain structures called chromosomes now a chromosome is a structure into which the dna in the nucleus is organized together with packaging proteins for the purposes of nuclear division and cell division that's what a chromosome is so here is an electron micrograph of a chromosome you can see the typical kind of x shape here so the chromosomes control the functions of cells particularly um, the ways in which cells uh, divide and they contain all of the instructions required to build uh, an adult from a fertilized egg cell in the case of human beings and other animals. Now this is again a little bit of a simplification. It's not that the DNA in the chromosomes controls the functions of all of the cells, but for GCSE purposes it's enough to say this. Just bear in mind that in fact the genes and the chromosomes are simply um, uh, a repository a storage vehicle for the um, or the DNA and the chromosomes are a storage system for storing genes which are the units of inheritable information genes uh, code for proteins and proteins are what gives the cells their structure and their function in large part um, but again for GCSE purposes it's enough to understand that the nucleus contains DNA which is organized into chromosomes which contain the genetic instructions the genes which control um, the structure and the function of organisms so in all body cells except gametes and except sex cells uh, each chromosome is a member of a pair of chromosomes called a homologous pair now most body cells possess two sets of chromosomes and are referred to as diploid gametes possess only one set of chromosomes and we use the word haploid to describe that so so chromosomes are not normally visible with a light microscope you need an electron microscope in order to view them and normally you don't really see chromosomes at all in any case for most of the cell cycle you do see them appear uh, and become visible shortly before cell division and during cell division because again the real function of these structures is to organize the DNA and the genes in such a manner that they can be properly distributed to the daughter nuclei and the daughter cells um, during cell division now once cell division is over the the DNA uncoils and you no longer see the chromosomes visible <laughs> 
So as a cell enters a period of cell division, the extended genetic information in the DNA coils up into these structures that we call chromosomes, and these then become visible with a light microscope uh, if you use the correct stain. Now, to really see their structure more clearly, you do need an electron microscope. So before a cell uh, actively starts to divide, the genetic material has already been copied so that each daughter cell can have a full complement of genetic information. So a chromosome normally has two distinct halves, as you can see here, and each is called a chromatid. So this would be one chromatid on the left-hand side of this chromosome, and here is the sister chromatid on the right-hand side of this chromosome. And these are joined at the centre by a structure called a centromere. <clears throat> so this is the general structure of chromosomes. So there are two distinct forms of cell division that we referred to before, mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis takes place in somatic cells or body cells throughout the life of an organism. Now this process always produces cells that are identical to the parent cell and also to each other. The purpose of mitosis is to allow cells to copy themselves, to replicate during growth and repair, and also to replace dead or dying cells. Now, in contrast, meiosis uh, is the type of cell division that only occurs in the reproductive organs, and the purpose is to produce gametes. Now, gametes are sex cells, in our case, sperm and egg cells, which have half the number of chromosomes, or are haploid, as the original parent cell, or any other body cell. Now, the reason for this is that in order for um, the first fertilized egg cell, the zygote, to be formed, uh, you first need a, a sperm cell from the male parent and a egg cell from the female parent. Now those fuse together. If each ha has half the uh, full number of chromosomes, that means the zygote, the first diploid cell, which divides by mitosis to produce the embryo and then the fetus and then the baby, um, is going to have the correct full number of cells. And so meiosis ensures that gametes are produced with half the uh, full number of chromosomes so that when those gametes from the male and the female fuse during fertilization, you produce a zygote with the correct number of cells. So you have an ovum and you have a sperm cell, each of which are haploid. So Animal and plant cells that, that arise as a result of sexual reproduction begin life as a single fertilized cell called a zygote. Now in humans, the egg cell and the zygote are both smaller than a full stop, but are some of the uh, pretty much the largest type of human cells nonetheless. So to become an adult organism, that zygote has to divide millions of times to produce a rapidly dividing ball of cells called an embryo, and eventually even uh, a larger uh, fetus and eventually uh, the baby which is born. So this happens by the process of mitosis. So you start with a single cell, the zygote, that divides to produce two cells, those two cells divide, each divide to produce a ball of four cells, eight cells, 16 cells, and so on. So here is a photograph of a human embryo at the eight, st at the eight cell stage. So we've gone from a single fertilized egg cell to a ball of eight uh, cells, which eventually will divide to produce even more cells by this process of mitosis. So mitosis, as I said before, produces new cells for growth and repair and occurs throughout the life of the organism. So mitosis can produce new skin cells, new bone, uh, uh, blood cells in the bone marrow, bone cells themselves, muscle cells, and in uh, other organisms we can produce, uh, for example in plants, root cells, stem cells, leaf cells, petal cells, all of these somatic tissues, these body tissues, are uh, produced by the division of cells uh, into uh, these tissues by mitosis. So the chromosomes in a dividing cell first appear as these long, thin, double threads called chromatids. They're double because they've just made an exact copy of themselves and the copies are attached to each other at the centromere. So the double chromosomes then become much th shorter and thicker and more visible. 
So here we can see only two chromosomes being shown here in this diagram, but this is just for simplicity's sake. In fact, a somatic human cell contains 46 chromosomes or 23 homologous pairs of chromosomes. So this is a photograph uh, to show the distinction here. And as you can see, there are so many chromosomes here, they're not clearly visible here. So we're just using a hypothetical diagram here of a cell that only contains one homologous pair of chromosomes just for the purposes of clarity here. So the chromosomes then move to the middle of the cell or the cell equator in this manner here. And again, you can see this happening in this photograph of an onion cell. Now at the equator, they then become attached to these long, thin fibers called spindle fibers, which emanate from these centrioles at either ends of the cell. The spindle fibers, once they've attached themselves to the centromeres of these chromosomes, then contract to pull the two chromatids apart and split the centromere. And then they further contract to move those sister chromatids, which are now referred to as individual chromosomes, to the ends of the spindle. <clears throat> so the cytoplasm, so we've just talked about mitosis, which is a form of nuclear uh, division. But now the cytoplasm, uh, the cytoplasm of that cell begins to divide by constricting in the middle. So the nuclear membrane then starts to reform and the two nuclei are then produced, the daughter nuclei. So the division of the cytoplasm is then completed and the two daughter cells are, are then formed. Now you'll notice now that the two daughter cells, um, each, each one of those two daughter cells have the same number of chromosomes as the original parent cell and they're also genetically identical to each other. So to summarize mitosis then, we start with the first phase of mitosis, prophase. Now in early prophase, the chromosomes appear um, as these um, two chromatids joined by a centromere. This is followed by late prophase where the chromosomes have condensed and spiralized and thickened to these structures which are more visible. Then in metaphase, the second phase of mitosis, the chromosomes move to the equator of the cell like this, and then are uh, the spindle fibers attached to the centromeres, uh, which, and the, the spindle fibers emanate from either end of the spindle where you find these organelles called centrioles. In anaphase, the third phase of mitosis, the chromatids are then pulled towards opposite ends of the spindle by the con contracting centriole fibers uh, and the centromeres have split to allow these sister chromatids to move to opposite ends of the cell. Now once the centromeres split, each one of these things that was formerly referred to as a chromatid is now referred to as a chromosome. So now we have the chromosomes at either end of this cell which is entering the final phase of mitosis called telophase. So another cell division now occurs and nuclear envelopes form around those chromosomes. So now we have two genetically identical daughter cells, each with the normal number of chromosomes, the original number of chromosomes in the parent cell. So all the animal and plant cells which develop from a fertilized egg cell except gametes are produced by mitosis. Mitosis produces daughter cells with the same number of chromosomes as the parent cell and the daughter cells are genetically identical to the parent cells. Mitosis produces the cells which allow for processes like growth and repair in multicellular organisms. So examples of this would be healing cuts and broken bones, replacing worn out cells like red blood cells, and to allow growth from a child to an adult. So you also need to know about mitosis in single-celled organisms where mitosis in eukaryotic single-celled organisms like for example amoeba is used for reproduction, asexual reproduction. So many living things can reproduce not just asexually but by sexual means as well as asexual reproduction. So asexual reproduction involves only one parent cell and produces two offspring cells by mitosis which again are exact genetic copies of the parent. So the amoeba for example reproduces asexually by mitosis and again the offspring are identical clones of the original parent cell. So here is a photograph of an amoeba. This amoeba would undergo the process of mitosis to produce two daughter cell amoeba, uh, each of which are identical genetically to the original. So asexual reproduction 
by um, uh, mitosis in amoeba occurs like this. You have a fully grown amoeba. This then becomes rounded in shape and its nucleus divides by mitosis. The nuclei separate and the cytoplasm gathers around each of these nuclei and the cytoplasm then separates completely forming two daughter amoebae. So differentiation then. Now an organism's growth and development is genetically programmed although it may be influenced by the environment. Multicellular organisms grow from a single fertilized egg cell by mitosis and we've seen that example in humans. So we start with one cell and that's, that single fertilized cell divides and divides by mitosis, originally, uh, eventually producing a ball of rapidly dividing cells called an embryo. However, all of those cells are genetically and structurally identical to each other. They all contain all of the genes necessary for the structure and the function of a full human being. However, so far, there are no discernible differences between these. These are undifferentiated cells. However, eventually, one end of this embryo is going to form the head, the other end is going to form the feet. So what is it that causes the cells to form brain cells and skin cells and liver cells and muscle cells? Well, this is the process of differentiation. And as that um, fetus enlarges, and again, the enlarging of this fetus is by the process of mitosis in all of these specialized tissues, the um, spinal cord, which is nervous tissue, the bones, which are bone tissue, and so on. But it's also happening by mitosis. So eventually you have one of these, which will grow up to, to one of these. So further mitotic division can occur over the body throughout the life of the organism. And again, once you are uh, in the adult phase, mitosis is not for development. It's for, um, again, growth and repair predominantly. So the process by which cells become specialized to perform particular functions is what we call differentiation. So as each new cell is formed, it grows and matures and becomes specialized to carry out a particular function. So this is the key point, and a lot of students will mistake one of these words for the other. Differentiation is the process by which cells become specialized. Specialization uh, is the unique features, the structures which uh, which make that particular cell um, well adapted to perform its unique set of functions. So most types of animals, uh, animal cells differentiate at an early stage of development during the development of the fetus. Whereas in plants, uh, plant cells retain the ability to differentiate throughout their lives. In mature animal cells, cell division is mainly restricted, as I said before, to replacement of dead cells, repair of damaged tissues, and also growth. Uh, and as the cells are already differentiated in animal cells, they can only divide and produce cells of that same type. So once you've got skin, the skin cells can only divide to produce new skin cells by mitosis. They can never divide and produce cells of a different tissue, of a different specialization, such as nerve cells. So all the cells that originate from the zygote, the first fertilized egg cell, are genetically identical because they're produced by mitosis. Now this means that all our body cells contain an identical set of genetic information in the chromosome. So for example, nerve cells, kidney cells, bone cells, you can see that all of these cells in your own body have very different structures because they have very different functions. And yet, if you examine the DNA from all of these, you'll find that it contains all, all of these cells contain the exact same DNA, the exact same genetic material. And yet they're all specialized to carry out different functions. Now, the question here is, how does, how does a nerve cell, um, how does a nerve cell be, uh, become a nerve cell, whereas a skin cell becomes a skin cell, if they both have the same genetic instructions within them? Well, the reason why these cells are all different or differentiated is that each type of cell has a specific certain combination of genes which are either switched on or switched off. For example, all human body cells have the gene that codes for the production of the hormone insulin, and yet in nerve or muscle cells, that gene is switched off because nerve and muscle cells, their function is not to produce insulin. However, in the cells of the pancreas, which whose function is to produce uh, insulin, among many other functions, that gene is switched on. <clears throat> so 
These are the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas and the cells of these pancreatic islets are differentiated and specialized to produce insulin. The gene for insulin is switched on in these cells, whereas in nerve or muscle or liver cells, the gene for insulin is switched off. So it's been known for some time that humans have special stem cells in their bone marrow that can produce the different varieties of blood cells, for example. So one stem cell can uh, divide and differentiate to produce a large variety of specialized blood cells. Now, when the stem cell divides, one daughter cell of that division must remain a stem cell to enable continued formation of other blood cells in the bone marrow. So, young embryos of animals and humans also contain undifferentiated stem cells. Now, stem cells from embryos can differentiate into any type of cell or tissue found in the organism. So, there's a lot of research being uh, conducted into exactly how these uh, embryonic stem cells differentiate and to find ethical sources of them because the, the potential for using these types of stem cells in, medical, in medicine uh, is enormous. Stem cells, for example, have the potential to treat a range of medical disorders which uh, currently are untreatable, such as paralysis caused by accidents to the spinal cord. <clears throat> so there's a lot of stem cell research being done, but there are ethical considerations because in order to get hold of the kinds of stem cells that can differentiate into any tissue, uh, one of the main sources of those is in embryos. But in order to take those stem cells from an embryo, frequently you are going to destroy the embryo. And so obviously this is going to uh, throw up a whole host of different ethical considerations and dilemmas. So uh, Christopher Reeve, uh, a famous American actor who played Superman in the original Superman movies, unfortunately had a tragic accident uh, riding in uh, 1995. He fell from his horse and the nerves in his spinal cord were so severely damaged that he was left uh, unable to move his arms or legs voluntarily. Uh, and this is called quadriplegia. Now, knowing that cells from human embryos can be made to grow into nerve cells, it may one day be possible to treat these kinds of spinal injuries by growing nerve cells in the damaged region of the spinal cord from embryonic stem cells. Now, currently, the stem cells are obtained from aborted human fetuses, and so this has not been achieved from, at present, but a lot of research has been uh, directed into this field of study for obvious reasons in order to uh, heal um, uh, very drastic injuries like this one. So stem cells can be seen in this photograph. So notice that these cells all look alike and they don't really look like any particular kind of cell. They don't look like muscle cells. They don't look like nerve cells. They're just these kind of very nondescript spherical uh, cells with very little in the way of distinguishing features. In contrast, these are, uh, imp uh, these are nerve cells and these were actually produced by uh, causing stem cells to differentiate by switching on the genes in those stem cells um, so that those stem cells differentiated to become these specialized nerve cells. So let's take a look at tissue culture now. So if we take an embryonic stem cell and we can then cause it to differentiate and become a specialized nerve cell, uh, a neural stem cell, which are the kinds of stem cells which can differentiate to become nerve cells. When this divides, this will leave one daughter uh, cell as a neural stem cell, whereas the other will differentiate and specialize into a nerve cell. So we can then take these nerve cells and uh, put growth factors um, and these nerve cells, causing them to reproduce themselves in vitro, in a growth medium, in an artificial growth medium. So now we take these nerve cells and then genetically modify them and test them and transplant them into the injured person's spinal cord, where they can then rebuild the motor and sensory neurons uh, and restore the feeling and sensation that that person uh, has lost due to their paralysis. So this is a potential application of stem cell technology. Now, in flowering plants, mitosis is much more localized than in animals. Mitosis in animals happens in pretty much every tissue, with the exception of a few tissues. So, uh, for example, once you get to um, uh, the uh, adult age, uh, your brain stops producing new brain cells. But in most of your other tissues, uh, growth and repair might continue. Um, so, in, in plants, however, um, certain types of plant cell uh, 
in certain very specific locations in the plant will remain uh, able to differentiate and specialize uh, throughout that organism's lifetime. So uh, the regions where you find um, uh, undifferentiated plant cells are called meristem or meristem tissue and this derives from a Greek word uh, which means to divide. So meristem is a region of undifferentiated cells which through mitosis give rise to new specialized cell uh, cells. So in plants the growing regions specifically the growing uh, root tips and the growing shoots but also the lateral meristem tissue found along the length of these roots and shoots uh, contains this meristem tissue containing these uh, undifferentiated cells which are able to divide and differentiate and specialize. So when a meristem cell divides like in animals, one of the cells remains meristematic and the other cell gives rise to more specialized cells. All of the cells, tissues and organs in a multicellular plant are derived from meristems. So plants grow in height due to the activity of zones of meristem tissue which are found a few millimeters behind the shoot tip. This is called apical meristem. So if we take a vertical section through a shoot tip, uh, we can find the developing leaves we can find the developing buds down here and at the very tip this is where if we uh, take a section and look at it under a microscope we can find the apical meristem cells these are the cells which are rapidly dividing by mitosis and then differentiating and specializing so here we can see these cells differentiating into xylem and phloem tissue in the tip in the growing root uh, in the growing shoot tip as the shoot grows to produce this transport tissue so this is a thin section of a plant stem uh, observed at a magnification of about a thousand times uh, under an optical microscope. These are stained sections showing the epidermal cells, the phloem cells, the meristem here, which is the lateral meristem, the cambium cells and packing cells as well. And here we can see the xylem tissue. Now, roots in plants will grow in length due to the activity of zones of meristem tissue, which are found a few millimeters behind the root tip. This is called also apical meristem. The term apex means the tip of something. So you can have the apex of the shoots just as much as you can have the apex of the roots. So here we can see the phloem tissue, the xylem tissue in the middle of the root. This is the central vascular or transport tissue of the plant. At the tip you see this root cap which is uh, really there to protect the uh, rather um, delicate meristematic tissue behind it. Here we can see the root hairs which absorb uh, um, water uh, with dissolved minerals from the soil and provide a larger surface area uh, through which to do so. And here we can see the meristem. This is where the root grows by cell division rapidly. Okay guys, uh, I see that we've come to uh, about the end of the first hour. So as promised, I'm going to give you guys a five minute break. Okay everyone. Uh, we're back after the five minute break. So let me just take a quick look at what you guys have voted for to do. Okay, so uh, having a look at the poll numbers here, it looks like about 70 odd percent of you have voted for me to continue with the uh, topic teaching, uh, optical and uh, electron microscopy. Um, so I will go ahead and do that uh, again. Um, if you'd like me to continue for an extra half hour at the end of this, I will go through uh, the, um, well, I will continue for an extra half hour. Uh, but again, we'll go through the uh, rest of this topic teaching and uh, you can then uh, vote for whether you'd like that half hour extension. Otherwise, we'll go into the Q&A section after that. Uh, and again, for those of you who wanted me to go through uh, exam questions, uh, obviously I will be uh, uploading the mark scheme for the exam question pack for this webinar onto the private resources page for you. Um, so please do look out for that in the next 24 to 48 hours. And if you have any questions about the exam questions pack or indeed about any of the topics that I've spoken about in this uh, webinar, again, go into the private webinar resources page, uh, which you can find uh, here. Uh, and you can find that by simply clicking this link on your uh, exam questions pack. And you can then use either the private question uh, and answer uh, like this. And type your question here if you want to ask me privately or you can uh, enter your comments here where other students will be able to respond and it would be nice to for you guys to get a good discussion going here as well and I will respond to these as well uh, so this will open up for you after this webinar concludes <laughs> 
All right, so let's take a look at optical and electron microscopy. So firstly, let's talk a little bit about uh, units of measurement. Now, uh, it's very, very important that you're clear about these because these are the kinds of uh, units and unit conversions that you're going to need, not just for biology, but for chemistry, for uh, physics as well. So, um, so let's take a look at uh, these units. So just bear in mind, uh, normally, microscopic things in biology are measured in micrometers when we're talking about optical microscopy and when you're down to the scale of electron microscopy you're looking at things on the um, on the order of nanometers so uh, micro the prefix micro in front of any measurement means one millionth of that measurement or 10, uh, 10 to power minus 6 nano is one billionth or 10 to power minus 9 and so uh, in terms of unit conversions one meter is 100 centimeters, so one centimeter is 10 millimeters because there are a thousand uh, millimeters in a meter. And because there are a million micrometers in a meter, one millimeter is a thousand micrometers. So because there are a billion nanometers in a meter and there are a million micrometers in a meter, uh, the conversion is one micrometer to a thousand nanometers. So uh, if you have trouble interconverting between these, uh, obviously you can ask and I'll be happy to help you further um, but you can uh, simply kind of just be aware of these conversions um, so that you kind of you can convert between them relatively quickly so there's a few key terms that you need to be aware of so um, you'll need to understand the meanings of these terms and be able to write these uh, use these terms uh, appropriately in your descriptive and explanatory answers in uh, exam questions particularly in biology where you find typically a lot more um, long answer questions, um, not just the six mark and four mark questions, but questions that require you to describe and explain uh, in kind of extended written language. So we're going to look at uh, specific key terms uh, relating to microscopy here. So firstly, the material or the th uh, what you put under the microscope to observe, that is called the object or the specimen. These are synonyms for the purposes of microscopy. So the appearance of that material when viewed under the microscope is referred to as the image. Now, this includes what you see with your eye when looking through the microscope, and it also refers to any um, recording that you make of that, uh, of that image, and that includes things like photographs or biological drawings. So, for example, if you're reviewing a Daphnia, uh, a tiny aquatic crustacean under a microscope, the Daphnia itself would be the object or the specimen, and the picture that you observed down the microscope would be referred to as the image. So you need to know the parts of a microscope, um, and so uh, you also need to know how to use them. Now, I'm not going to go into the use of a microscope because uh, you're not going to be really tested on, uh, you're not going to have a microscope put in front of you in an exam and asked to use it, but you do need to know about the parts of a microscope and what they do. So the modern optical microscope, optical microscope refers to microscopes that use light. Uh, is essentially an instrument that uses a series of convex or converging lenses through which the light can be focused to obtain an enlarged image of a very small object. And typically, it's made up of these main parts. So you have the light source, which can be a bulb. It can also be a reflecting mirror, which collects the ambient light from the surroundings and passes it through the first lens, which is called the condenser lens. The condenser lens then passes, uh, focuses the light onto the specimen, which is on the slide, and the light then passes through the specimen or is transmitted through the specimen. And then it is then magnified by the objective lens and then further magnified by the eyepiece lens. So the three lenses that make up the optical system are the eyepiece lens, the objective lens, and the condenser lens. Now it's important here to understand that the condenser lens does not contribute to the magnification of the device. It's only the eyepiece lens and the objective lens which actually magnify and produce the enlarged image. So here we can see the eyepiece lens, which is used to view the image formed after the light has passed through the objective lens. This is the coarse focus knob and the fine focus knob. Here we can see the objective lenses. Now there's usually three of these in a rotating platform, which you can use to, uh, and you can use that rotation to interchange between those and find the best magnification to view your image. Here we have the stage for positioning the slide object, and you have clips typically to hold the, uh, the slide in position. Here we have the condenser unit, which contains the condenser lens and the diaphragm. 
and you have a lever to control the iris diaphragm. Now the iris diaphragm is used to con uh, control the amount of light passing through uh, the specimen and this uh, can allow you to illuminate the specimen more brightly or less brightly as required. Now in the case of this particular microscope that you're seeing here the source of light is a concave mirror uh, which collects the surrounding ambient light and passes it uh, through the condenser unit. Now some microscopes like this one will contain a bulb inside them which is the actual source of the light. So uh, the most important factor in producing a good image with a microscope is the ability of the objective lens to reproduce detail in the image. Now the ability to reproduce detail is, re uh, is referred to as the resolving power or the resolution of the microscope. So resolution is defined as the smallest distance between two particles which allows them to be distinguished from one another by that particular uh, microscope. Now the unaided human eye has a resolving power of about 0.1 millimeters. So in other words, it can just about distinguish between two lines separated by 0.1 millimeter of distance. I think I said one millimeter. I meant to say 0.1, sorry. So if you had two thin lines drawn next to each other on a piece of paper, for example, if they were 0.1 millimeter apart, the average unaided naked human eye could just about tell them apart as two separate lines. If they're any closer than that, then they will simply appear as one line to you. This is what we mean by resolving power or resolution. Now, in contrast to that, the re resolution of a light microscope is 200 nanometers, 200 billionths of a meter. And the resolution of an electron microscope is 0 0.2 uh, nanometers, 0 0.2 billionths of a meter. So this gives you a sense of just how much detail can be resolved by the optical and the electron microscope in comparison to the unaided human eye. <clears throat> So the resolution of the light microscope is limited and it's limited by the wavelength of the light which is being used. Magnification on the other hand is not dependent upon the resolving power but the but as the magnification uh, with the optical microscope increases the limited resolving power gives blurred images. The best optical microscopes that you can get operate at a resolving power of approximately 0.2 millimeters with a magnification of up to 1500 times. Now this is the very best optical microscopes that you can get. Now there are various variations on optical microscopy, for example confocal or fluorescence microscopy, but we're not going to be going into those here because that kind of goes into A-level territory here. So different magnifications can be obtained, as we said before, by choosing different objective lenses. Focusing is achieved by changing the distance between the objective lens and the specimen on the stage, the object on the stage. <clears throat> So here we have the eyepiece lens. Now typical eyepiece lenses ha uh, are usually have a magnifying power of between 5 and 15 times. Now objective lenses on the other hand vary in their magnifying power. Typically on an optical microscope like the one being shown in this diagram here you will have three objective lenses with different um, magnifying powers. So the most commonly used objective lenses that you're likely to find for example on a school uh, microscope are times 5, times 10, times uh, 20 and times 40, sometimes even times 100 magnification. <clears throat> now the times 100 magnification lenses, if you do see those, typically these are called oil immersion lenses because in order to use them properly you usually have to place a small dot of oil on the surface of the cover slip and then lower the um, uh, the objective lens, the, the actual surface of the lens, or raise the platform so that that oil just about touches the objective lens. Now the purpose of this is to eliminate any air between the surface of the cover slip over, over the specimen and the objective lens because at that kind of uh, magnifying power the air itself will cause a loss of focus. So the total magnification of an optical microscope is obtained by multiplying the magnifying power of the two lenses which actually do the magnification. Remember, you have a condenser lens down here 
and an objective lens and an eyepiece lens, but it's only the eyepiece and the objective lens which actually does the magnification. The condenser lens is before it, in the light path is uh, before the specimen, and so the condensing lens doesn't actually magnify the specimen. It simply uh, focuses light uh, from whatever the source happens to be through the specimen so that the specimen can be viewed. By the time the light passes through the specimen, that's when it can then be magnified by first the objective lens and then finally by the eyepiece lens. So to get the total magnification, you multiply, you don't add, you multiply the objective lens magnifying power uh, by the eyepiece magnifying power. So total magnification of uh, an optical microscope is the magnification of the eyepiece lens multiplied by the magnifying power of the objective lens. So modern optical microscopes are essentially an instrument that uses this series of convex lenses. So we mentioned that there are two lenses that do the magnification, the eyepiece and the objective lens. So let's take an example here. So this photo of some onion cells was taken at a magnifying power of times 200. So this is the image, this is a photo, but it's, it's obviously enlarged in comparison to the actual uh, length of the cell. So let's imagine that we want to know the actual length of one of these cells, the actual length of the specimen, not in the image. We have an image in front of us, and so let's say we take a ruler and we measure the length of one of these cells on the image, on the photo, in millimetres. So we take our ruler and we try and, as accurately as possible, measure the length of one of these cells. And we find that the cell has a length of 60 millimeters. So in order to calculate the magnifying, uh, or in order to calculate the size of the actual cell, the sample or the specimen, we need to use the following formula. The size of the object is equal to the size of the image divided by the magnification. So I'm going to pause here for a sec and uh, let you guys um, see if you can use this formula to calculate the actual length of the cell. Okay, so here's how we do it. So we've got our, our formula. We are trying to calculate the size of the object. So the formula as it stands is uh, doesn't require a rearrangement. So we simply uh, enter our values into this formula and we evaluate and we get 0.3 millimeters. So the actual size of the actual length of this particular onion cell is 0.3 millimeters. This is the size of the specimen or object, but this was the size of the image, 60 millimeters. Great. So this photo shows some human cheek cells, which were taken at a magnifying power of times 500. We want to know the actual length of a cell. So once again, we take a ruler and we measure the length of the cell in millimeters. So in this case, we find that this particular cell has a length of 30 millimeters. So use the formula again and calculate the actual length of the cell. Okay, so once again, uh, we use the formula. The size of the object is equal to the size of the image divided by the magnification. So the actual length of the cell, we simply substitute our values and we get 0.06 millimeters. Now, obviously, if you know any two of these quantities, you can calculate the third uh, by rearrangement. <clears throat> so that's optical microscopes. Now you do need to know a little bit about electron microscopes. So let's take a look at electron microscopy. So this is an image of various types of spores uh, taken with a scanning electron microscope. So an electron microscope looks very different as you can see, and this is actually quite an old fashioned, uh, this is a very old image, but you can see it does look very, very different from an optical microscope. This is a, um, and so it's clearly a very different type of machine. They do work in very different ways. So the light microscope only allows us to see the relatively larger structures within a cell. So for example, um, within larger cells, you can see things like nuclei, um, but you can't really see tiny structures like ribosomes particularly. Uh, but a, an optical microscope allows us to see much smaller and finer structures because again, it's not just the, res uh, the magnifying power, which is much higher with a, uh, an electron microscope, the actual resolving power is much higher as well. So let's take a look at some of the comparative advantages and disadvantages of optical versus electron microscopes. So uh, light microscopes, in terms of advantages, they're relatively cheap to buy. Uh, in comparison to electron microscopes, which conversely are very expensive, uh, they're cheap to run 
with light microscopes using little or no electricity, whereas uh, electron microscopes are very expensive to run because it's expensive to power the, uh, the machinery that generates the beam of electrons, but it's also very expensive to maintain. So in light microscopes, uh, preparing the specimen for a light microscope is relatively straightforward, and I'm sure you've all done it yourselves, whereas to prepare a specimen for an electron microscope is actually a very complex procedure. Now, because of the, that procedure, it's actually impossible to view living specimens under an electron microscope. So actually, um, a light microscope has that advantage. Living and dead tissues and cells can be observed with a light microscope, whereas living cells cannot be observed under an electron microscope because the actual process of preparing the specimen ends up killing off the cells. Now with light microscopes you can produce color images. Now with electron microscopes the images produced do not have color because you're not using light to see the object, you're using electrons. Now you can add false color to electron microscope images but that's false color, that's just added by a computer to distinguish uh, image, uh, uh, objects in the image uh, from each other. Now, the, dis the main disadvantage of an, a light mi microscope compared to an optical microscope is that the resolution is limited, and it's limited by the wavelength of light. Now, if you have two objects closer to each other than the wavelength of light that you're using, then the optical microscope cannot resolve those, uh, those two objects as separate objects. But in comparison, the res resolving power of an electron microscope is much, much higher because you're using electrons. Electrons have a much, are much smaller than a wavelength of visible light. The other disadvantage of a light microscope in comparison to an electron microscope is that the depth of field is uh, severely restricted, whereas with an with a, um, electron microscope, particularly with scanning electron microscopes, a greater depth of field can be observed. Finally, the obvious limitation of a light microscope compared to an uh, electron microscope is that the magnification is limited. Even the best optical microscopes um, have a, result, uh, a magnifying power of approximately no more than about 1500 times, which is quite high in comparison to, uh, say, the naked eye, but nowhere near the kind of magnifying power of an electron microscope, which is in the order of up to 250,000 times. So electron micrographs show specimens that have been extremely highly magnified. Now to gain a sense of proportion and size from these kinds of images, it's necessary to be able to obtain uh, and interpret magnification data and scale lines which are drawn on the image. Now in your exam questions, um, you're going to need to be able to use things like scale bars and uh, uh, the, the equation that we've already seen to calculate things like object size. Uh, but it's the same procedure as for um, electron microscopes. So we're going, to, we're going to use the electron microscopes and images produced by an electron microscope to illustrate that. So magnifi and magnification is a value that tells us how much larger the image is than the original object. If we rearrange that equation that you saw before to make magnification the subject, we get this. The magnification is the ratio of the size of the image which is produced to the size of the original object. Now, because you're comparing these things, magnification, um, in, you, you must have these two sizes in the same units. If you have the size of the image in centimeters and you have the size of the object in nanometers, you're not going to get the correct magnification. Uh, in, in order to get that, you need to, there should be an equal sign there, sorry about that guys. Um, but in order to get the correct magnification using this equation, these two numbers must be in the same unit. So once again, you may need to convert one or more of these units into the same units, depending on the question that you're being asked. So uh, if, for example, you have an image which measures 30 millimeters and the specimen or object measures three micrometers, then the image value must first be converted into micrometers. So 30 millimeters is 30,000 micrometers. And therefore the magnification, once you have these image, uh, these uh, um, uh, in, in the, the size of the image and the size of the object in the same units, micrometers, then you can only then should you be substituting them into the equation to get the magnification, which is in this case, 10,000 times. Now we can also uh, calculate the size of an object using this same equation. We would need to rearrange once again to get the, um, to make the size of the object, the um, 
subject of the equation. Now in this case you would need to multiply both sides by size of the object and then divide both sides by the magnification to get this. The size of the object is equal to the size of the image um, divided by the magnification. So if an image is measured and found to have a length of six millimeters and the magnification is 40,000 times, what would be the size of the object? So first of all, again, you need to convert your units into the same units. So uh, if we want to solve this, uh, solve this question, we first need to convert um, six millimeters into micrometers. And so the actual size of the object, because we're going to be measuring something um, in um, uh, micrometers, is going to be this. Now, this should say micrometers, guys. Sorry about the, uh, the, the typo here. Sometimes when I'm doing voice recognition, uh, it comes up M as, as uh, instead of um, mu. So, yeah. So there you go. You got the calculation there. Well done. All right. So... Uh, there's a couple of different kinds of microscopes that you may need to be familiar with, depending on your exam board. So let's take a quick look at those before we move on to the next uh, topic here. So firstly, there is the transmission electron microscope. Now, the word transmission uh, typically is used in science to describe uh, the movement of uh, some kind of energy or particles through a material or through some object. So in this case, transmission electron microscopes like this one, uh, this is an electron microscope that uses a beam of electrons which actually passes through the specimen. So this was developed in the, uh, in the 1930s. And uh, again, it's the short wavelength, the small size of the electron beam, which allows for both the high resolution and the higher magnification. So in uh, transmission electron micrographs, we can magnify up to 500,000 times while still allowing a very fine level of detail and depth of field. However, the procedure required to prepare the specimen is quite complex and unfortunately does end up only producing dead specimens for us to observe. So part of this procedure involves very thin sections of material uh, which are then stained using solutions of heavy metals to produce the contrast required in the observed image. So here's an example. So this electron micrograph shows longitudinal mus uh, skeletal muscles and this shows the individual fibrils inside the skeletal muscle cells which are responsible for the contraction of those cells. This is a very, very high level of magnification. This is about 75,000 times. So these are referred to as Z lines. These are the ends of the contractile units called sarcomeres. So if we wanted to know the actual length of the sarcomere, the distance from this Z line to this Z line, uh, we would need to measure the image. So this is our image. Imagine we have a photograph in front of us. We would take our ruler and we would measure the sarcomere and find that on our image, it's 130 millimeters in length. So this is the size of the image of the sarcomere. So given the information that, we've, that I've just provided for you, calculate the uh, actual length of this sarcomere in the actual muscle cell. So uh, here's how we do it. So first of all, we need to rearrange the uh, formula to make size of object the subject. And so this is what we would get. Uh, we've already got the actual, um, uh, the size of the image in millimeters converted into micrometers already. So we can simply enter the values into here for size of image and magnification because we want the size of the object in micrometers. So we plug our values into our equation and we evaluate and we get 1.73 millimeters. Well done. So let's take a look at the other type of electron microscope. This is called the scanning electron microscope. Now, in fact, there are other types of uh, microscopes as well, which I'm not gonna get into here, called things like uh, scanning tunneling electron microscopes. There are even more weird and wonderful microscopes like the atomic force microscope, if you wanna go into, if you wanna go and research that, it's very interesting. Uh, but for the purposes of what we're talking about here, let's just take a look at the SEM, the scanning electron microscope. So this is uh, a scanning electron micrograph of uh, a hair mite. So uh, many of you might find that quite disgusting, but these are incredibly small organisms, uh, incredibly tiny animals, but you can see just the incredible level of detail and also just how almost three-dimensional it looks. Um, 
the depth of field here is staggering. So this is the kind of image that you can produce using an electron microscope. Now, you might be wondering, why is it in color? I, you know, you mentioned, uh, you might be thinking um, <laughs> that I mentioned uh, that uh, electron micrographs are black and white. Well, yes, they are. But this is the kind of false color which computers, which are attached to these uh, electron microscopes, can add to the images to provide uh, uh, more depth of field and better distinguishing uh, or more easily more uh, allow you to distinguish more easily uh, of from one object in the image to the other so this was uh, has been in use since about 1963 and this is uh, the type of microscopy in contrast to uh, it, uh, transmission electron microscopy transmission again uh, involves the electron beam actually passing through the uh, the, the sample uh, whereas the scanning electron micrograph actually bounces a beam of electrons, several beams of electrons, off the surface of a sample and then detects the scattering. And this produces a more three-dimensional image. Uh, and it's used specifically to uh, study the surfaces of solid objects, such as insects, like you saw in the last one, or pollen grains. So again, in this case, the electrons don't pass through the specimen because of the, uh, because of the thickness of the specimen. Uh, we're not looking at very thin slices of tissue here. We're looking at solid objects like pollen grains, like tiny insects, like the surfaces of things. And so um, what uh, the, the staining process, the preparation of the, um, of the specimen is slightly different here. What, what happens in, in processing the specimen ready for examination under a scanning electron micrograph uh, microscope is we coat the surface of the specimen in a heavy metal, such as a thin layer of gold. And so the electron beam is reflected as it strikes this surface. Now we have special detectors around the specimen, which then detect the scattered electrons. And then this sets up electrical signals, which are then processed by a computer to produce uh, those beautiful images. And those images are somewhat three-dimensional representations of the surface of that specimen. So here we can see a scanning electron micrograph um, of uh, blood, and here we can clearly see this biconcave disc-shaped red blood cell and a neighboring white blood cell here as well. Now, that previous image that you saw is black and white, but again, computers can be used to add false color to these images. Uh, so that you can more clearly distinguish uh, objects in the foreground from each other and from the background like this. Here's another scanning electron micrograph of a pollen grain, and this shows the detail on the surface of this incredibly tiny object. So let's take a look at some more worked examples of magnification and uh, in particular the use of scale bars. So the magnification can also be determined from scale lines. Now you saw on that previous image, for example here, that this bar appears on the image. This bar is showing you that any object here in this, uh, in this image which has this length has an actual length of five micrometers. That's what these scale lines and scale bars, and you can actually see one at the bottom here. So this length on this object represents five micrometers. So the magnification can also be determined from scale lines. So once again, uh, we're going to use a similar equation, but it's slightly differently applied. So when you're, when you're doing calculations concerning scale lines on the images from optical and electron microscopes, you need to use this. So the magnification is the length of the scale line measured divided by the length of the scale line given on the image. So let's take a look at an example here. So the scale line here gives us a, a, a value of five micrometers on the uh, image. So this is the scale line given on the image. This goes on the denominator, the bottom half of this fraction. Now when this line was measured on the image using a ruler, so imagine for example uh, I take a ruler, obviously not this one, but let's just say we take a ruler and we measure this. And let's say for the sake of argument that the ruler that we use to measure that uh, gave us a length of 30 millimeters. Now again we must put these lengths in the same units. And so, since we've got the given uh, length of the scale line in micrometers, we need to convert the measurement that we took of the scale line with our ruler uh, into micrometers. So 30 millimeters is equivalent to three, uh, 30,000 micrometers. So therefore, to calculate the magnification, we can now simply substitute our two values, which are in the same units, into this equation. 
we evaluate and we get that this image is being produced at a magnification of 6,000 times. So here's uh, another example. So the magnification of uh, 6,000 can be used to obtain the actual dimensions of the structures represented in the micrograph. So again, let's say we have this image and let's just say for the sake of argument, we took our ruler and we measured the length, the diameter of this red blood cell. And we found that it's about 42 millimeters. Now again, 42 millimeters is equivalent to 42,000 micrometers. So if we wanted to find out the actual diameter of this red blood cell, how would you do that? So again, I'm going to pause here and give you guys a chance to have a go at this question. All right. Excellent. Okay, great. So most of you, uh, approximately 72% of you this time got the answer correct. Well done. So let's uh, walk through this. So the actual diameter of the red blood cell, we take uh, the actual diameter is going to be equal to the size of the image divided by the magnification. That's the rearrangement of that first um, equation that we saw. So we substitute 42,000 divided by 6,000 for the magnification and we get uh, 7 micrometers. Great. Well done, guys. Okay, so the next topic that uh, you all voted for prior to this webinar for me to uh, to, to to cover, or rather the uh, the next the topic which received the next highest number of votes, was the process of culturing microbes and uh, aseptic techniques. So let's see if we can cover that in the remainder of this one-hour segment. So um, now going back to asexual reproduction. Now bacteria reproduce asexually and this is by binary fission splitting in two now because binary fission is analogous to um, mitosis in eukaryotes essentially all the individual cells that are produced uh, by binary fission are genetically identical to the original parent cell and this of course does not take into account mutations and things like that so if we have a bacillus, which is a type of uh, rod-shaped bacterium, it undergoes uh, division by um, binary fission. We have two daughter cells. Now, sometimes these can undergo spore formation, and these spores can then germinate to produce mature bacilli. So this is one type of uh, asexual reproduction. These are sporulating bacilli, a particular kind of bacterium that actually uh, uh, has sporulation, the production of spores, involved in its, uh, its life cycle. Now, when environmental conditions are optimal, bacteria can divide roughly once every 20 minutes. Now, this, uh, this it means that one bacterium can rapidly form a very large number of bacteria. So imagine, for example, you take one of these antiseptic uh, surface sprays uh, and you spray down a surface to kill off 99.99 or however many the manufacturer is claiming of the bacteria on that surface. Well, let's just assume one of those bacteria is left over after that. So let's, I'm going to show the number of bacteria versus time here. And we're assuming that these bacteria reproduce themselves every 20 minutes. Well, because of, because of the binary fission, the rate of bacterial reproduction is in fact exponential because the more bacteria you have, the more bacteria you have, which are actually dividing. And so, uh, in a re relatively small period of time, that single remaining bacterium can produce billions of bacteria. And so this gives you a sense of just how rapidly bacteria can divide and produce more bacteria. <clears throat> So microorganisms such as bacteria, but not just bacteria, unicellular um, uh, fungi, um, protists, unicellular eukaryotes such as uh, pro uh, protists such as uh, amoeba, for example, these can be grown in a culture medium which contains the nutrients and other substances necessary uh, as energy sources. So carbohydrates, for example, mineral ions, and, and also sometimes proteins and vitamins if they're needed. Now these nutrients often uh, are contained in agar, which is uh, which is a uh, medium that can be liquefied and then poured into a petri dish, where it can then solidify into a clear layer that can be used to culture those bacteria. So colonies of E. coli growing on nutrient agar are being shown here. Each one of these little dots is a colony of millions and millions of organisms, uh, resulting from the, from the mitotic division of a single bacterial cell. Division occurs equally in all directions, and so the colony has a circular shape. Now, if the colony has a non-uniform shape, this can indicate that the bacteria are actually motile, that they're able to move and probably have flagelli. Uh, 
So colonies of fungi grown on nutrient agar are shown here. So you can note here in this image that these colonies have this fluffy appearance. Now this is because uh, uh, colonies of fungi, particularly multicellular fungi, form these multicellular threads called hyphae. And that is actually the multicellular fungus. When you see toadstools and mushrooms, those are the fruiting bodies, the reproductive organs that the mycelium, which is made up of these this fine network of, of hyphae underneath the surface of the soil, is uh, it's the the toadstools and the and the um, and the mushrooms. These are the reproductive apparatus which that mycelium under the surface of the soil is producing in order to spread spores to other locations. So these fluffy, uh, the fluffy kind of uh, um, discontinuous appearance at the edges of these, that's because of these fine filaments called hyphae. So here we can see uh, E. coli and fungi grown on nutrient agar, and you can you can tell which is which very clearly. Uh, from their different morphology, from their different appearance. So my microbial colonies can also be grown in nutrient broth, which is kind of like a soup of nutrients to form a microbial suspension. Now this type of growth allows for small samples of the colony to be taken from that, uh, that flask and then transferred to other media like agar uh, in petri dishes for further investigation or imaging or experimentation. So scientists often just want to study the growth of just one type of bacterium. So this means that the first thing that they have to do is to isolate the desired bacterium. The term aseptic technique is used to describe the proper handling of cultures, sterile apparatus and sterile media, growth media such as agar and nutrient broths to prevent contamination by other microbial species which are undesirable. So in order to obtain a pure culture of a single species of microbe, it first needs to be grown in laboratory sterile conditions. So all of the necessary nutrients first have to be provided and the surrounding environment, as well as the media, have to be kept sterile to prevent contamination. So here we take the petri dish with nutrient agar in it and we sterilize it by heating it up to 120 degrees. We then take a bacteriological inoculating loop and we sterilize that by heating in a blue Bunsen flame until we can see that it visibly becomes red hot. It's then allowed to cool briefly in the air before being used to aseptically transfer a culture of microorganisms such as bacteria. Now, the inoculating loop, <clears throat> excuse me, the inoculating loop first needs to be flamed and sterilized after each use of uh, that inoculating loop in transferring microorganisms from one medium to another. So now the cooled inoculating loop is used to collect microorganisms from a tube culture. To do this, the bung in that, uh, on that tube is removed from the tube containing the microbial culture and the neck of the tube is then passed through the Bunsen flame. We say that the tube has been flamed. This process destroys any unwanted microbes in or on the opening of the culture tube. So now the cooled inoculating loop is then used to collect microorganisms from the culture. The loop is then held still. So you don't move the loop in, you hold the tube, the, the loop still and you move the culture tube uh, uh, across the tube and remove it in this manner. So the neck of the culture tube is then flamed again and the bung is then replaced. So the next step is to take the lid of the petri dish and raise it just about sufficiently to allow the microorganisms to be transferred from the inoculating loop to the nutrient agar. And then you streak the microbes across the surface of that agar. The lid of the petri dish has then been removed in this, in this photo just to show more clearly that streaking process taking place here. So this animation here kind of summarizes uh, that process. So we flame the tip until it's red hot. We allow it to cool. We then flame the, the opening. We then transfer just uh, with the lid of the Petri dish uh, just far enough above to allow us to do that and no further to prevent uh, or to minimize the risk of microorganisms, airborne microorganisms uh, entering the agar uh, Petri dish. So after inoculation, the petri dishes are stacked and then placed in an incubator at the desired temperature and then left for a specific time period. 
So petri dishes are usually incubated upside down in stacks in the, the manner being shown here. And incubating the plates upside down, the reason for this is that it stops condensation forming on the surfaces of the agar, which would wash all the microbes across the agar surface. The idea of a streaked agar plate is to allow distinct microbial colonies to grow separately. So after sufficient incubation, uh, the microbial growth can then be studied and the type of microbe or even the species can then be identified in this way. So here we can see a bird's eye view. The dishes are lying flat on a backlit screen so that we can see the um, microbial colonies here. So on streaked agar plates, several streaks can be observed where colonies have merged together. So this kind of heavy growth is really of no real interest because it, can, can, it could consist of more than one species of microbe. It's the distinct individual colonies, the circular colonies that we saw before, which are of interest to a microbiologist because each colony represents a pure culture that's developed from just one microbial cell or spore. The physical appearance of distinct individual colonies is an important first step to the identification of the species of the microbe. So in this photo, the microbe, which, which has been uh, 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 incubated, has been, is a uh, bacterium. So one of the things that uh, many of you uh, sent me private messages about and uh, asked for me to include in this segment is, uh, is uh, antibiotic resistance and the ways in which this is measured and uh, investigated using aseptic technique and culturing techniques. So this can be studied and quantified by placing what we call an assay disc. Now an assay disc is made from thick paper and it has uh, small uh, subsections which have been soaked uh, in different antibiotics. Now the way that you use these is that you take a colony of uh, microbes such as bacteria growing on a, the surface of a petri dish and we t uh, again that bacterial culture is uh, derived from a single microbe so it's all the same species. You then place the assay disc over the surface of that colony and these uh, labels indicate the segments of the assay disc where we have these different antibiotics. <clears throat> so, uh, for example, you have these eight different antibiotics on this assay disc. Now, the way that this is used is that uh, we place it face down onto the surface of the agar so that it can be inspected from underneath. The agar may already have an existing microbial growth or smear on it, um, and so what we're doing is we're trying to see the effect on that existing colony of those different antibiotics. But if you're studying the prophylactic or preventative effects of those um, antibiotics, uh, then the bacteria will have been inoculated onto the agar, but not yet incubated. So here is a diagram showing the lid of the petri dish. Again, we just lift it high enough just about to place the, um, uh, the assay disc onto the surface of the agar. Again, this is to minimize contamination by airborne microbes. So let's take an example here. So we take an assay, we take assay discs and use them to assess the antibiotic effectiveness on two different microbial species, Staphylococcus albus, which is the gray colony, and Micrococcus luteus, which is the yellow colony here. Now the results after 24 hours of incubation are shown here. So here we can see that the there are these areas of clarity where the colony has been killed off and the sur surrounding agar medium has been cleared of this Staphylococcus albus, this grey colony. And similarly, around some of these antibiotic discs here, we see that there are areas where the, uh, the Micrococcus luteus colonies have been killed off. So essentially, the wider, the bigger these areas around these antibiotic discs, the more effective those antibiotics are at killing off these organisms. So zones of clearing are how we measure these things. So these zones of clearing, these zones where the, uh, the microbial colonies have been cleared by the presence of these antibiotics um, indicate uh, how effective these antibiotics are. So here's the question, which bacterium is fully resistant to which antibiotic? Uh, 
All right, well done. <laughs> Most of you straight off. Yep, so it's this one here. So we see that Micrococcus luteus, this microorganism growing on this petri dish, it's not resistant to these antibiotics because we have zones of clearing around all of it. And yet around this antibiotic, methicillin, uh, we have no zone of clearing. The uh, Micrococcus luteus organisms are perfectly able to live right next to where this antibiotic is. Now, in contrast, this uh, organism, Staphylococcus albus, is, is not resistant to um, any of these antibiotics, including methicillin. Now, you may have heard of MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's one of these so-called hospital superbugs, um, and this is a a uh, highly resistant form of a uh, bacterium which lives in all almost everybody's uh, nasal passages and upper respiratory tracts. The difference with MRSA is that it is resistant to a very wide range of uh, antibiotics, including methicillin. Methicillin is um, it's a, an antibiotic which is very rarely used unless doctors uh, consider the case to be an emergency. It's a kind of last line of defense antibiotic. It's an antibiotic which doctors will use to treat a, a, an infected patient when all of the other antibiotics that they've used have failed, partly because it's, it has some very nasty side effects. And so if an organism is resistant to methicillin, uh, it's uh, it's very bad news because it's, it's likely to be resistant to all uh, a number of other um, antibiotics as well. Now, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, unlike this one, is resistant to a lot of these antibiotics as well as methicillin. And so when somebody contracts MRSA, uh, it's usually pretty bad news for them. Okay, so disinfectants. Now, uh, we can also measure the effectiveness of disinfectants. Now, disinfectants are not the same as antibiotics. The antibiotics are substances which are usually derived from natural sources like fungi, for example, which will naturally kill bacteria in particular. Now, disinfectants typically are artificial chemicals like, for example, bleach or, or surface wipes or uh, things like that, uh, which do kill a wide range of um, microorganisms, including bacteria, but also things like fungi. Uh, and so this, these prevent their growth. Now, unlike antiseptics, disinfectants are not used on the body. They are used to disinfect um, uh, objects such as toilets. They're used to disinfect surfaces such as in food preparation areas, hospital wards. Now, the, the effectiveness of, dis of disinfectants as well as antiseptics. Antiseptics are um, chemicals which are used to clean body surfaces, for example. So when you get a cut, you put some antiseptic uh, lotion on the cut. And this, what this does is it kills off any microorganisms from the environment that are likely to get into the cut and prevents it from being infected. But the effectiveness of disinfectants as well as antiseptics can be, um, can be uh, uh, assessed, can be measured by using the same kind of procedure that you just saw uh, in that uh, previous slide with the assay discs. Okay, everyone, looks like we've come to the end of the second hour. So uh, I will uh, break for another five minutes or so to give you guys uh, a little bit of a breather. Okay, everyone, we're back after the uh, five minute break here. So let's take a look at uh, what you guys have chosen to do. So in terms of uh, the option to extend for an extra 30 minutes, um, most of you have said no. So 85% uh, of you have said you'd like me to go straight into the Q&A, which I'm happy to do. And uh, I see that uh, you've asked a lot of questions or a lot more questions that were than were originally in the Q&A box. That's great. Okay, so uh, you've also had a chance to upvote each other's questions. So um, it looks like that upvoting is still going on here. So I'm only going to give you another 10 seconds or so before I uh, move into the Q&A segment. Uh, so... Uh, let's see here so far okay all right so it seems like the question that has been asked in the q a box that most of you have upvoted uh is to do with explaining um uh the transport across cell membranes so things like diffusion osmosis and uh, active transport so let's begin with that let me just go ahead and find the relevant slide here <clears throat> All right. So, transport of dissolved substances. Okay, so um, now 
In terms of uh, understanding this, you need to understand this in terms of uh, three key processes, diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. But the thing that seems to trip up most students, and indeed the uh, comments that I'm getting uh, already, is to home in specifically on uh, the idea of surface area to volume ratio. So diffusion and osmosis and active transport, these refer in this context of cell biology specifically to the processes by which dissolved substances are transport, uh, transported across cell boundaries, across plasma membranes, cell membranes. So um, let's quickly do a review of what these uh, processes are. So the idea of a plasma membrane is that it is partially permeable. Now, the proper term here is not partially permeable, it's selectively permeable. A partially permeable membrane is a, a membrane which allows certain things through and not other things. But a selectively permeable membrane, like a living membrane, such as a plasma membrane, is considerably more clever than that. It can allow certain things through in one direction, it can prevent certain other things from going in another direction, it can also change its permeability depending on a number of different conditions. Now, those of you who go on to study A-level biology, you're going to go into this process in a lot more detail, and you're going to see just how miraculously complex and clever the plasma membrane is at um, selectively uh, allowing certain things through in response to, for example, hormones and various other uh, signals originating from outside and inside the cell. But for now, uh, just be aware that it is more correct to refer to a plasma membrane or a cell surface membrane as being a selectively permeable membrane. So let's take an example of an amoeba. Here we have the plasma membrane. So it allows certain substances, certain ions, certain molecules, certain uh, dissolved substances and also water to pass across it in either one direction or another direction, the opposite direction or in both directions, but it will not allow other things to pass at all. So to enter or leave a cell, dissolved substances must cross this membrane. So three main ways this can happen, diffusion, osmosis and active transport. So let's start with diffusion. So firstly, uh, diffusion is defined as the random movement of particles in one average direction across uh, between two points. It doesn't have to be across a membrane. Uh, in chemistry, you will have come across diffusion um, in an experiment such as this one. So water molecules are in a constant state of motion. They collide, they move around, they intermingle all the time. If you add a drop of ink to a container of water, then this motion um, causes the ink to separate and spread out into the spaces between the water molecules and the water molecules to spread into the spaces between the ink molecules. This is called diffusion because what you have is the random movement of molecules from a region where they begin in high concentration to the surrounding regions where they are in lower concentration until the molecules are evenly distributed throughout that solution. So substances diffuse from where they are concentrated to where they are less concentrated. We refer to this diffusion as happening down a concentration gradient. So diffusion is the net movement of molecules down their concentration gradient by random motion. So from regions where the molecules are in high concentration to regions where the molecules are in low concentration. So the direction or the rate of flow uh, and also the rate of flow, how fast the diffusion happens, are related to three main factors. Firstly, the concentration gradients. How different is the concentration from uh, one uh, at one position to another position? So here we have a membrane in the way, but it doesn't have to be the case in, in the case of diffusion, as we saw in the previous example. So... Um, Three main factors will affect the speed at which uh, diffusion happens. The temperature will affect it, the concentration gradient will affect it, and the diffusion distance will also affect it. So temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energies of particles. Now, if diffusion is the random movement of particles, then on average, if you raise the temperature, the particles are moving more rapidly, and therefore the rate of diffusion will increase. Uh, concentration gradient also determines the rate of diffusion. The bigger the difference in concentration of molecules from one point to another, the faster the molecules on average net will move from one direction to another. Now, the key point here is net movement or average movement. 
it's not that the molecules are just moving from the left hand side here to the right hand side they're moving in both directions but there's more molecules on this side moving randomly than there are molecules on this side moving randomly and so the net movement overall is in this direction from left to right from high concentration to low concentration <clears throat> so the final thing is the the final factor that affects the rate of diffusion is the diffusion distance the the distance between the two points where we're measuring the rate of diffusion now again the the shorter that distance then the greater the rate of diffusion the bigger the distance the lower the rate of diffusion because the molecules have to move a further distance and so that takes more time so what kinds of particles can actually diffuse well matter exists in three main states there's gases there's liquids and there's uh solids now liquids include solutions now a solution is a liquid containing dissolved uh, substances dissolved particles and so in gases because the particles are moving rapidly diffusion happens relatively quickly because again diffusion is the random net movement of particles in liquids and solutions because the particles and liquids uh, and solutions are moving uh, at a lower speed on average than in a gas then again the rate of diffusion is going to be comparatively less solid particles only vibrate around average positions they don't move translationally past and over each other and so diffusion doesn't happen in solids now let's look at osmosis now osmosis is a special case of diffusion it's a kind of if you if you imagine a venn diagram you've got diffusion and then within that you've got osmosis osmosis is a special case of diffusion which applies only to water molecules uh, in osmosis water molecules move from a region where the water molecules are in high concentration in other words a dilute solution to a more concentrated solution where the water molecules are in lower concentration and unlike diffusion the definition of osmosis includes the fact that they must be moving through a partially permeable or selectively permeable membrane so the definition of osmosis is the net random movement of water molecules from a region where the water molecules are in high concentration and another way of saying that is a dilute solution to a region where the water molecules are in low uh, are in low concentration in other words a um, more uh, a more concentrated solution through a selectively permeable membrane so this illustrates that here so here we have the water molecules this is a, a sugar solution so we see here because the sugar solution is concentrated on this side and you have little or no sugar on this side this is a concentrated solution this is a less concentrated solution and so the direction of diffusion here is going to be from the solvent the pure water to the solution where you have comparatively fewer water molecules in the same volume of space <clears throat> so this animation shows what we're talking about here so once again remember it is the net movement you do have water molecules moving in the opposite direction but the number of water molecules moving randomly from here to here is much greater than the number of water molecules moving from here to here and so the net movement is from dilute to more concentrated solutions so once again we have an osmotic gradient osmotic gradients refer to the difference in the number of water molecules per unit of volume versus the number of uh, water molecules per unit of volume on the other side now osmosis will continue until the number of water molecules per unit of volume is the same on either side and at that point you have no net movement <clears throat> so that's osmosis now uh hopefully that answers uh the question as far as um diffusion and osmosis is concerned let's quickly go to active transport now so active transport unlike osmosis and diffusion which are passive processes osmosis and diffusion happen just by the random movement of molecules it does not require you to put energy into the process in order to get that net movement of particles now active transport is um in contrast active it requires a net input of energy so some animal and plant cells can absorb substances from a dilute solution to a more concentrated one in other words against a concentration gradient this is called active transport because it requires energy input because you're moving 
particles in the opposite direction to which they would normally move by the random net motion. So this moves, this means that more of a vital substance can be absorbed than by passive diffusion alone. And so active transport enables cells to absorb, for example, ions from very dilute solutions or to recover those molecules which are precious to the survival of the organism. So here we have an active transport protein and here we have a uh, concentration gradient uh, which is from low to high and this is this is going against the concentration gradient because the concentration gradient for diffusion purposes would be in this direction from where the molecules are in high concentration to where they're in low concentration but these membrane proteins these active transporters will actually move molecules against the concentration gradient in this direction and they do so by means of ATP. ATP is the molecule which cells use to carry energy around and use it uh, wherever it's needed. In this case, to change the shape of this protein so that these molecules can be moved against the concentration gradient. I hope that answers your question. Okay, great. All right, so let's move on to the next, uh, the question that received the next highest number of votes. Oh, sorry, actually, yes, so, sorry, before you all stop protesting. Uh, you mentioned, uh, many of you mentioned that you wanted me to talk about surface area to volume ratio. Now, uh, obviously, um, when you're, when you're uh, transporting substances across a membrane, a membrane is a surface. And so one of the other factors that affects the rate of either diffusion or osmosis or active transport is the available surface area over which that process can take place. The bigger the surface area, the more active transport or osmosis or diffusion that you can get to take place. And so uh, particularly multicellular organisms uh, rely on um, certain body systems which are exchanging substances. So for example, the alveolar epithelium in your uh, in your lungs or the uh, intestinal, uh, the, the um, inner surface of your intestines which are absorbing the digested products of uh, your um, uh, of your digestion. These have to maximize the surface area, but it's not just about surface area. It's about the ratio, the comparison of surface area to volume. So let's quickly take a look at that. <clears throat> okay, so surface area. So single-celled organisms, let's start with these. So single-celled organisms such as amoeba and some algae have a large surface area to volume ratio. Now this means that dissolved substances don't have to go very far to, to travel into or out of the organism. Now in cases like this, um, you uh, the, the process of diffusion, passive processes like diffusion, is enough to supply that organism, that unicellular organism, with all of the materials, such as oxygen and nutrients, that it needs to survive, and also to remove all of the waste products of that organism's metabolism, which, if they were allowed to build up inside the organism, um, would uh, poison the organism. So what we're saying here is, if you're a single-celled uh, organism, like an amoeba, your volume is so tiny but in comparison to your volume, your surface area is big enough that all of the substances you need to get rid of can just pass through the membrane by uh, either simple diffusion or um, active transport if required, but that's less relevant. Um, in, uh, and also all of the substances that you need to take in from your environment, you're talking about a tiny volume and a tiny distance. And so you can simply use diffusion to move the substances like oxygen that you need into the cell. You don't need to do anything more than that. However, um, let me just skip past this. Okay, so however, when you get to larger sizes, the, the process of diffusion alone is not sufficient to supply a larger mass of living material with the necessary substances it needs from its environment or to get rid of the uh, metabolic waste products and uh, substances which you need to get rid of, like carbon dioxide, something else needs to happen. What needs to happen is somehow the surface area to volume ratio needs to be increased to uh, provide for those needs. So here's uh, how surface area and volume are represented. So imagine we have, um, again, this is highly hypothetical, but imagine the cubes that we that I'm showing here um, representing cells with different dimensions. So here's a cell with um, uh, edge lengths of one millimeter. Again, obviously, this is highly theoretical. So 
if each one of these uh, surfaces of this cube, and again, the cube has six sides, um, has a surface area of one square millimeter, then the su total surface area of the cube is going to be uh, six millimeters squared. In contrast, if we wanted to find out the volume of this cube, we would need to multiply the height times the width times the depth. And that would be one times one times one, which gives us a volume of one cubic millimeter. And so the ratio of surface area to volume for this one millimeter length edge length cube is six to one. That means there's six times as many units of surface as there are units of volume. So for a single cell, you've got lots of surface area compared to volume. And so you can supply the living volume of that cell with, with substances by diffusion uh, at a rate which is enough to sustain the life of that organism. Now let's imagine if I increase the size of this cube to where the length is two millimeters, let's see what that does to the surface area to volume ratio. So we see here that just doubling the length, the, the, the length of the sides, well, the total surface area with, with substances by diffusion uh, at a rate which is enough to sustain the life of that organism. Now let's imagine if I increase the size of this cube to where the length is two millimeters, let's see what that does to the surface area to volume ratio. So we see here, so we see that increasing the, 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 the length of the side of the cube by one unit, doubling it, uh, reduces the surface area to volume ratio to three to one. So what happens if we now increase the size of the cube to three millimeters? Well, again, now we have a total surface area of three times three for one side of the cube, times six for all six sides of the cube, 54 square millimeters. The volume is going to be three times three times three, which is 27 millimeters squared. So uh, millimeters cubed rather. So now we have a surface area to volume ratio of two to one. So what is, this, what is the actual implication of this? So if we uh, think about how surface area and uh, volume change with size and how they relate to each other, we can summarize our values together with another value for a cube of length four millimeters in this table here. So we see the surface area to volume ratio goes from six to one to three to one to two point uh, two to one to one point five to one. If we plot these as a graph of cube edge length in millimeters versus surface area or volume in millimeters squared or millimeters cubed, so the pink line is surface area in millimeters squared, the red line is volume in millimeters cubed. Look at what happens as the length of the side of the structure increases. So we see that surface area and volume increase exponentially but the rate at which the surface area uh, or the volume in increases is greater than the rate of the surface area increase because volume the side of the cube is raised to power three whereas for surface area the side of the cube is raised to power two and so volume increases at a greater rate than surface area and if we compare this to surface area to volume ratio surface area to volume ratio exponentially decreases as you increase the edge length of that cube. So what does this all mean then? Well, this means that as the size of a structure or an organism increases, the surface area does not increase in proportion to the volume. Multicellular organisms, therefore, have a smaller surface area in relation to their volume than unicellular organisms. And this means that in larger multicellular organisms like ourselves, Diffusion on its own across our body surface is nowhere near efficient enough to provide us with the nutrients and oxygen that we need from our environment. Therefore, multicellular organisms have evolved transport systems to um, carry dissolved substances that they need uh, to sustain the life around their bodies. And exchange surfaces, such as the surfaces of the lungs, the inner surfaces of the intestines, have become highly modified to maximize the surface area to volume ratio. So, uh, so how is this done? Well, shape is an important factor because so far we've just been considering a, a uniform cube. So consider the following tubular and cubic structures, uh, both of which have a volume of eight cubic millimeters. So here we have a cubic structure with a volume of eight millimeters, but here we have an elongated uh, tubular structure. We have eight cubes 
laid end to end, each cube has a volume of one cubic millimeter. But look at the difference in the surface area to volume ratios. The surface area to volume ratio of this is 4.25 to 1. The surface area to volume ratio of this on its own is 3 to 1. They both have the same volume. So we see here that elongated structures with the same volume as cubical structures have a higher surface area to volume ratio. And this is why uh, those exchange surfaces, such as the ones in your intestines, are folded into finger-like elongated projections for the purposes of maximizing that surface area to volume ratio so that they can more effectively absorb uh, nutrients. So gas and solute exchange in multicellular organisms, these are structurally adapted to maximize the exchange of materials across their uh, surfaces. So typical structural adaptations are things like a large moist surface area. It needs to be moist because uh, things like oxygen need to be able to dissolve into a liquid before they can dissolve across membranes. You also need a well-developed transport system so that the dissolved substances can then be transported away from the exchange surface to wherever it is that they're needed. So this is the vascular system in plants and the circulatory system in animals. You also need a good system of ventilation and control where the gases are to be exchanged, so breathing in humans and also the control of stomata uh, in the uh, surfaces of leaves by guard cells in green plants are examples of this. Now, where the dissolved materials are exchanged between two different so uh, solutions, there is a countercurrent flow system. So this is found in the gills of fish and also in the kidneys in vertebrates like ourselves. Now, we're going to go into uh, the kidneys in more depth in a later webinar in this series of GCSE biology webinars. So uh, I won't go into more detail there, but there are some other good examples. So all human and uh, human organs and body systems have characteristic features which enable them to efficiently exchange the raw materials and the products of cellular metabolism in opposite directions. So two particularly uh, good examples that we've referred to already are the respiratory system and also uh, the, uh, the lining of the small intestine. Now, in both cases, we have highly um, maximized surface areas, alveoli in the lungs and also villi and microvilli in the small intestine. So uh, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I don't want to go into too much more depth there because we've only got a few more minutes here. So uh, let me go on to uh, the next question here. So the next question is um, about optical microscopy. Um, so, oh, I see. Okay, so that question's already been answered by... Um, all right, so sorry, sorry. So some of you have retracted that question in chat. Okay, guys, so uh, the remaining questions uh, seem to be about topics which aren't really related to this one. So um, unless any of you have some relevant questions. Okay. All right, so, okay, that's fine. No problem. <laughs> All right, guys, so uh, we're coming towards the end of the Q&A segment anyway, so I'll, I'll stop it there. Okay, guys, so uh, thank you once again for um, for attending. Uh, I hope that was useful to you. Uh, you're, you're all very welcome. <laughs> it's very nice kinds of kind words of feedback there. Uh, again, guys, uh, um, as always, uh, if you do have any uh, questions that arise after the webinar or you'd like to um, ask me any specific questions uh, relating to um, the topics or the exam questions, please, please, please go to the... Uh, private uh, resources page for this webinar. Um, those of you in attendance, you've all got the exam question pack. So just go ahead and click this link. It will take you to the private resources page. Uh, somewhere within the next tw uh, 24 to 48 hours, I'll be uploading both the video and the other resources, um, the slides that you've seen, uh, the exam uh, question mark schemes. Um, and also uh, remember there is a chat box there that you can continue to ask me questions all the way up to the end, end of the exam period at the end of June. Um, and also, if you'd prefer not to ask those questions uh, where other attendees can see them, uh, please do use the uh, private messaging function. And uh, normally I will respond to those questions within 24 to 48 hours. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for attending. I hope that was useful and I will see you in the next webinar.